Please be seated. <clears throat> it is my privilege this afternoon to welcome you all to this funeral and thanksgiving service for Ada Catherine Preston, a dearly loved mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, aunt, and Christian friend. Sadly, Ada's family are unable to travel from Northern Ireland to be here physically today, but we are glad that they are able to join us over the internet. And let me extend a particularly warm welcome to you, Ruth and Dennis, and your families, and also express sincere sympathy to you in your loss from all of Ada's friends here at West Worthing Evangelical Church. We're all familiar, I think, with the old saying that the best things come in little parcels. Well, that was certainly true of Ada. She may have been little in stature, but she made an immense impact in many lives, as you can all no doubt testify. She was bright, humorous, caring, and had a dogged determination which served her well all her life. But undergirding all her personal qualities was her deep faith and commitment to her Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so we start this service with a hymn that reflects something of her faith, the sands of time are sinking. Now, as you know, sadly, we can't sing, but we can stand as the music is played and the words are sung by a congregation not here, an absent congregation, and, and we can mouth the words behind our masks. Best we can offer you. Let us stand as the music plays.
please be seated. Now let's come before God as we pray together. Let's all pray. <clears throat> our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we come to praise and to thank you for all your many mercies to us and to acknowledge our dependence upon you. Everything we have comes from you, ultimately, and even our next breath is not a right, but a gift from your loving hand. But we want to thank you especially for all that you have done for us and given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his glorious resurrection. We bless you that he made the way back to God from the sin that separates us all from you. And on a day like today, when we are reminded of the inevitability of death, we cannot thank you enough that for all who trust in Christ, death is not the end of love, life and hope. We thank you that we belong to another realm than this, that we are citizens of heaven. We are awed that there we shall see our blessed Saviour and Lord and enjoy his company forever. We rejoice in this Christian hope, a sure and certain hope that cannot be frustrated. And we thank you too that our sister Ada is now experiencing the reality and wonder of this, free from the difficulties and restrictions of this life. We praise and bless you for her life, that quiet faithfulness to you, her love for your word, the Bible, and that steadfast faith in you which sustained her to the end. We thank you for the time that she lived in Offington Park Care Home and the impression that she made on so many. And we thank you for the unfailing love and care shown to her by the staff. But Father, we are human, and you know the grief and pain that the loss of someone we love brings. And so we pray for the family particularly, and then ourselves, that you will strengthen us all now by your Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us to worship you with reverent and submissive hearts, and to put our whole trust in your perfect wisdom love and power. Bless to us the reading of the words of eternal life, that by steadfastness and the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope and be lifted above our darkness and distress into the light and peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now uh, Roz is going to come and share some memories of Ada and uh, bring a tribute to her. And immediately after that, uh, we shall have a solo, Oh, the Lovely Face of Jesus, sung by Roz's husband, Keith, uh, accompanied by Jonathan on the uh, keyboard. Thank you so much. come together today not only to mourn the passing of Ada Preston, but to remember her life and to honour that memory. She was born Ada Catherine Cowie on the 11th of January 1925, the second of four children, a Yorkshire lass, and spent her growing years in Sheffield and Hull, with a brief spell as an evacuee in Whitby. When the family relocated to Wantage for a couple of years during the war, she went to work as a wages clerk at the American Air Base there, where she met Robert David Preston, known to my brothers and me as Uncle Bert. He was working as a heating and maintenance engineer at the base. Food was short because of the war, and he courted her with food from the American Airman's Canteen, which she shared with her younger sister Molly, our mother. <clears throat> in 
She moved to his native Belfast, and they were married there, where she lost her Yorkshire accent and acquired the Belfast brogue that all of us were so familiar with. They had three children, Dennis, Ruth, and Leslie. Sadly, the need for shielding and the difficulties of travel during the pandemic have prevented her children and their partners, her two grandchildren, her six <coughs> great-grandchildren, and her three great-great-grandchildren from being physically here today. But they are very much present with us, watching the live stream of the service from their homes. Ada Preston was a many-faceted lady with an impish sense of humour, an infectious zest for life, an immense love for all her family, a great servant heart, and a deep devotion to the Lord Jesus. As we have exchanged stories about her in the past few weeks, we have roared with laughter as much as we have mourned. She retired to Donaghadee, where her granddaughter Stephanie remembers spending some weekends with her. She remembers her granny taking her to Pink's Green to play in the park and spending hours on the beach and having Billy Bear ham sandwiches for picnics. Patsy, her other granddaughter, remembers, I often stayed with Nanny Preston and she would let me water her houseplants. I remember eating peas straight from her garden. She passed on this love of growing plants to me and I think of her when sharing fresh peas that I've grown with my own grandchildren now and so the circle of life continues. And who could forget the lovely occasion when five generations were gathered together in the living room at Hurston Close for her 90th birthday. Ruth recalls a time when she and her mum crossed the Irish Sea to visit Ada's brother, Bob. Ruth says, as we drove across from Liverpool to Hull, we were singing Christmas carols in June because I couldn't get the car radio tuned into local stations. Ada was fond of telling one particular story about herself. Soon after her daughter Ruth was born, she walked up to the shops one day with Ruth in the pram and Dennis walking beside her. All the way home, Dennis was skipping and giggling with evident hilarity, but he wouldn't tell his mother what he was laughing about until they reached home, when he gleefully pointed out to her, you forgot the child, you forgot the child. Sure enough, she had passed parked Ruth's pram outside one of the shops and then forgotten to collect her before work, walking home. She had to hurry all the way back into town to where she had left her, where the sleeping Ruth was blissfully unaware of the drama around her. The distance of miles and the Irish Sea between them meant that Ada and our mother Molly didn't see each other during the years that they were raising their families. In fact, they went 25 years without meeting, other than briefly twice at their mother's funeral and their father's subsequent wedding. So our Auntie Ada was not really part of our childhood. She came back into our lives in 1975 when she came to visit us shortly after we moved to Woking. And at the age of 16, I began to get to know my Auntie Ada, who remained a very important part of my life from then on. <clears throat> this meant she was a prominent part of our children's childhood and they all have very treasured memories of her unstinting love for them and also of her mischievous sense of fun. In many ways, she was the biggest kid among them. Jez recalls her camping out on their sofa in Woking when she came to visit, by which time she was well into her 70s. In sharing family photos over recent days, we have found several with our various children in them, not a few involving Auntie Ada with her skirt hitched up, paddling in the sea with the children, quite frequently without first removing her tights. Jonathan recalls that she had many amusing toys and gadgets which she would produce when we visited, such as a wind-up pair of racing nuns. In February 1993, she moved to Worthing permanently to live with Molly, our mother, and the two of them spent their final years together, eventually moving into Offington Park Care Home, 
when they could no longer manage to give each other the level of care needed. I remember shortly after she moved in with our mum, there was a cold spell and a very heavy snowfall. I rang them in the morning after the snow had fallen deep during the night to make sure they were okay and had all the shopping they needed. Auntie Ada answered the phone to me, waved away my concerns about whether they were all right and proceeded to complain to me that mum wouldn't let her go out into the garden and build a snowman. Why not, I asked. I don't know, she replied. Put her on the line to me, I told her. I'll have a word with her. Auntie Ada passed the phone to mum. Why won't you let Auntie Ada go out in the garden and build a snowman, I asked. Mum chuckled as she responded, because she's still in her nighty. <laughs> on another occasion, they were holding the regular weekly prayer meeting at their house when a latecomer rang the doorbell. Auntie Ada answered the door and greeted him with, Oh, thank goodness you've come. I'm so glad you're here. He expressed some surprise at the fulsomeness of the greeting, and she replied, with that wicked twinkle of hers, well, there were only 13 of us, and that's terribly unlucky for a prayer meeting. <laughs> Ada's continuing cheerfulness was all the more remarkable because she had not had an easy life and was no stranger to tragedy. Her much-loved husband, Bert, died when she was in her mid-40s in 1971, leaving her to continue raising her children as a widow. His photograph remained prominently displayed in her room to the end of her days. Her children grew up during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, which took a terrible toll of them personally. And then in February 2005, her beloved youngest child, Leslie, was killed in a motor accident, a tragedy from which it's true to say she never fully recovered. As my mother and aunt grew frailer, and my youngest child left home for university, I took to spending two or three nights a week with them, driving up the A24 from my office in Epsom on a Wednesday evening and returning home to Farnborough at the weekends. What I observed during that time was how much of every day was devoted to prayer. They would each sit up in bed with a cup of tea and an open Bible, reading and praying for at least an hour before getting up. They would then come downstairs and share breakfast together while doing the Daily Telegraph crossword, and then out would come the Bibles again, and the many prayer letters to which they had subscribed, and they would spend the next hour sharing from the Bible and praying faithfully from the many prayer requests they had received. Jonathan's observation resonated with us all, that as our mother Molly's arthritis increasingly limited what she was able to do, Ada's care for her was admirable, selfless and constant, until she reached the point where she was no longer fit enough to continue, and at that point they both moved into Offington Park. During her declining years, Auntie Ada became increasingly bedridden and suffered various ailments, some of them painful. I visited her regularly until the pandemic put an end to visits, and during all that time, I never once heard her complain. In fact, I found her unfailingly cheerful in all circumstances, continually expressing gratitude to those who cared for her. She often spoke of her yearning for heaven, and we rejoice today in the confidence that she is now where she longed to be, face to face with her Saviour. As I've heard so many stories about Auntie Ada recently, I wish I'd known her and I could have shared in all these memories. But of course the fact is, Ros and I were married only last September and so I didn't meet Auntie Ada until last autumn. But I also feel that I do know her very well. And I know the most important thing about her. And that's because of what happened three days before she died, which I want to tell you about. We were sitting by her bedside. 
And Roz was holding her hand and praying. We were praying with her. And suddenly, in my mind, I heard the words I'm about to sing to you. God had connected me to her thoughts. Perhaps God was transmitting from him the thoughts that he knew she was thinking, however it works. But God had connected me to her thoughts, and I wrote them down there and then. And because of these words, I don't actually need to know her any better. I know the most important thing about her, and I feel I know it very well. And she was, and she is at this moment, a lover of Jesus. She's in victory, and we can celebrate that. Oh, if anyone would like any of these, these words afterwards, I have a few spare copies. to abide beneath his kindness that is where I want to be never more to leave his presence never more to stray away always to glory in the brightness of eternal day. All my longing met forever, and I shall never part. Once with him, with him, to turn to God's word and uh, be encouraged by uh, the experience of God's people to be encouraged by the faithfulness of God. Reading from uh, Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. 
What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. In the presence, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And then over in the New Testament, we're turning to Paul's letter to the Ephesians and chapter 2. And the reason I'm reading this is because uh, it obviously meant a great deal to Ada, and I can understand why. She had a bookmark in her Bible at that place when the family looked, and it was quite heavily marked, that passage. And of course, you can understand why. Because in that chapter, we are faced with the desperate need that we all have and the wonderful, amazing grace of God that comes and reaches down to us and transforms our situation. Let me read. Paul writes like this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And now we have another hymn which has been chosen for us. Someday the silver cord will break, and as before we'll stand when the music starts.
I regard it as a very great privilege to be conducting this service today because Ada holds a very special place, not only in the hearts of the family, which is obviously paramount, but also in the hearts of Christians and her fellow church members here at West Worthing. It's some time since she went into Offington Park care home, but I can still visualize Ada and Molly sitting over there on a Sunday during our services. And I guess that all of us here have memories that we can find comfort in at this time and which encourage us. But we are also here, of course, to face the fact that Ada has gone from us. Death is the ultimate human experience in this life. It's definite and irrevocable and in its presence, sometimes we may wonder just how much we count for. So I want to look at this from God's perspective this morning and I want to turn you to a verse from our first reading, Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why? Well, first of all, the death of God's people is precious to God because of God's view of his people. Do you notice how they're labelled here? You know, in the Bible, there are lots of different names sometimes used uh, for God's people. And in the New Testament, particularly, you find words like disciple, athlete, farmer, soldier, servant, steward, sheep. And that sheep is not always compliment meant in a complimentary way. Because we all know how silly sheep can be at times. But here, we come across the word saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, I guess the word saint doesn't always conjure up very helpful pictures for us. For many people, you mention that word and immediately they think of stained glass people and stained glass windows with people dressed in what appear to be woolly maxes with gold dinner plates behind the back of their heads. Or else we think perhaps of a select group of Christians who are particularly noted for their piety and who have been screened by the church for ages to find out whether or not uh, they are worthy of this title. Or else, but the Bible, you see, doesn't talk like that. The Bible does not talk like that. It talks about all God's people as saints. And I imagine... Even then, people might say, saint, I suppose that means they're the kind of person it's uncomfortable to be around with. Someone remote, unapproachable, not really clicked in to normal life. Well, if they had met Ada, they, that idea would have been dispelled immediately. I imagine, and I hope I'm not lying, <laughs> I'm not slandering her here, uh, that as a child she could have been quite a bit of a handful. Uh, certainly I guess she was a daredevil. I can remember one of her stories that she told me about the day as a child, there she was with her, I almost said gang, a group of friends, shall we say, these lads. And there they were on this high bridge and they turned to her and they said, they dared her to get up onto the narrow edge of the bridge and walk across it to the other side. And no sooner the word than the deed. She was up and along. And she retained a lively spirit into her older years. She was an interested woman. She took interest in things. She was gregarious. She had, as we've heard, that irrepressible quick-fire wit of hers. Very often, the ties I wore on a Sunday were the victim of that. And, of course, you will know that she never lost her love of sugar lumps. How she managed to chew them and suck them down without teeth, I do not know. A very human woman, but in Bible terms, a saint. And that word saint, the idea behind it and within it is of being set apart. It's more to do with status than sanctity, to do with position rather than perfection. Set apart. God's action in marking out for himself someone. Now, of course, when, when God 
draws someone to be a Christian, he has no intention of leaving them just as he found them because he is in the ultimate makeover business. He's turning people day by day into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what life is all about. That's what he does with his people. So every believer is a work in progress. And Ada gladly identified herself with that, and she sought to cooperate with the Lord. As we've heard, her life has been, there have been ups and downs, tragedy and heartache. But even then, she knew the Lord's strength and love. When she came over here, and when I first started to come along to this church, you could, there were certain things you could count on. That she would be there, as was Molly, to, twice on a Sunday, morning and evening. There they would be at the prayer meeting and the Bible study. There they were supporting the women's meeting because they knew that these were important aids in building their relationship with God. And it was only illness that would keep either of them away. Now, of course, uh, since COVID-19 made its appearance, um, it has not been possible to visit her in the, in the home at Offington Park. But prior to that, whenever you went to see her, she would always welcome reading from God's word and prayer. And uh, again, prior to that, uh, one of our members used to visit her regularly, practically every Sunday afternoon. And she would always want him to read the Bible and to pray with her. And she would select the passage very often. On one occasion, Roger asked her what she wanted him to read, and she said Psalm 119 all 176 verses, and he manfully complied. I have to say that on another occasion when he asked her what she wanted him to read, he, she said to him quite emphatically, not Psalm 119. So we give thanks for one of God's saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is a death of his saints, because that's how he views them, a saint, someone he set apart. But also... The death of uh, his saints is valuable, is precious, because of his valuation of his people. Their death is precious because they are precious. And why are they precious? Because of his choice. Saints, as I said, equals set apart. And set apart introduces that element of choice. Who set them apart? And the amazing truth about Christianity is this. God sets apart that becoming a Christian is not anything to do with where you were born, where you live, certain ideas of how life should be run, not an attempt to clean up our lives when we see messes in them, not going to church. Some of these things can be brilliant and very helpful, but that's not it in essence. It's not becoming a Christian, not even some decision we make, even though we do have to make one. First and foremost, if you're a Christian, it's because God chose you. And that is nothing to brag about, nothing to get swollen headed about, because, because he didn't choose us because we were wonderful people. And they're precious not only because of, uh, of this choice, but because of the cost. Again, you see, setting apart points us in this direction. So God sets us apart. From what? Well, unless you've been living on a remote desert island at the top of a great ivory tower in your own little personal bubble, you must know that our world is not really in the best shape. And I'm not just talking about the pandemic. There are all sorts of problems in our world, all sorts of injustices all sorts of wrongs in people's hearts and lives and problems that affect our planet, our country, our own lives. What is it? Some decades ago, uh, it was actually in the 20th century, I believe, there was a famous correspondence in the Times newspaper under the heading, What's Wrong with the World? 
And G.K. Chesterton, you know, the author of the Father Brown stories, uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote a very short letter. He wrote in response to the question, what's wrong with the world? Dear sir, I am, yours sincerely. And that's it. The problem is with ourselves. We live in a world which is in rebellion against God, which denies his sovereignty, which doesn't want his hands upon our life. We deny our need of him. And men and women become so blinded that they believe that this world alone counts for anything. So blinded that they believe that true happiness can be achieved apart from God. And for God to bring us out from that blindness, from that situation, from that sin, to set us apart involved a cost that only he could pay. And that's what the good news of Jesus is all about. God himself taking human nature, coming to live amongst us, lining up with us, identifying with us, living a life, a perfect life, which we didn't stand a chance of living. And then going to the cross and taking upon himself all our failure, all the things that cut us off from God, all our self-absorption and self-will, and paying the price for it there so that we could be treated as if his perfect life was ours. And it's that gospel where we find our identity and we find our value. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, God does not love us because we are valuable, but we are valuable because God loves us. That's why saints are precious. And Ada knew that. Yes, she knew she came from a background where uh, the gospel was known. She came from a Christian home, I believe, and yet she came to the point and knew she had to come to that point where she, she saw her own sin and need and recognised the cost Jesus Christ had taken on her himself so that she might become one of God's own people. And when she did come to that point, she embraced Jesus as Saviour and Lord, gratefully. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why precious? Because of God's vision for his people. Why does the writer here emphasise the death of God's people anyway, so particularly? Because of God's vision for his people, because, you see, death is the entry into God's presence. Death is not an end, it's the beginning. It starts here, and for the Christian it is coming home, not only to their Lord, not only to their King, not only to their Saviour, but to their Heavenly Father, who loves them so much that he gave up his Son to death on a cross. They are precious to God. The death of the, of the saint is precious to God because it means they've finished their course, they've learnt the lessons, they can finally be where they were meant to be, at home with their father. Jesus told a very familiar story, uh, well, three stories, in Luke chapter 15. talked about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. But in the midst of one of those, uh, in the application of the second story, Jesus said this, just so, as the shepherd rejoices, just as this woman who found the coins rejoices, so he says, just so I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Have you ever asked yourself who's rejoicing? Well, we say the angels are rejoicing there in the presence of God. I have no doubt they were. But that doesn't exhaust what Jesus is saying. There is joy before the angels of God. Who's rejoicing before the angels of God? Why, God himself. God rejoicing that someone has come home to him. When they've become a Christian, when, they, when he puts his hand upon them and draws them to himself. And I guess part of the angels rejoicing is because they see how much it means to God. Now, if God rejoices like that when someone is converted, becomes a Christian, 
don't you think he's going to rejoice when they come home to heaven? Don't you think he rejoiced when Ada stepped out of this life right into his presence? But their pressure, the death of, their, of his people is precious because it means that his children are perfected. No more weakness. No more illness. No more sin. No more struggle. No more failure. No more imperfections. And also, the death is precious because God still has work for his people to do. Do you think heaven's going to be one long rest? Well, think again, folks. Heaven, as we think of it, is not our final destination. The Bible promises that, uh, that when Jesus Christ returns, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That is the final destination. And in that new heaven and in that new earth, every one of God's people will be busy. They will be contributing. They will have something to contribute, and every contribution will blend with that great hymn of praise and worship and thanksgiving that rises to the throne of God. And Ada will be there. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, will I? We're going to sing the final hymn. Oh, no, we're not going to sing the final hymn. We're going to stand and mouth it with the, uh, uh, with the music. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun.
Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can safely commit Ada to your care, for you love her even more than we can. We thank you that you have answered the longing she expressed so often and that she is now at home with you. We thank you for the encouragement of the Christian gospel, which not only promises hope and purpose, but delivers it. But now we pray for your comfort to surround those who mourn their loss. We commit Ruth and Dennis and their families to you, that you might heal their pain and give them strength in the coming days. We also commit to you the wider family, Rosamond, Jeremy, Jonathan and their families and all who are saddened by Ada's passing. And now may the hands of God the Father uphold you. May the hands of God the Son enfold you. May the hands of God the Holy Spirit enable you. And may you rest secure in the threefold embrace of the one true God, now and forevermore. Amen.